What's going on? This is the Saturday Down South podcast. I am Connor O'Gara. Will, crystal ball season is officially here. Yes, Love sir. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me ask you this, because I see crystal ball season and I get excited. What is your favorite part of the college football calendar? Because crystal ball season's up there. It's not mid-August, I'll be honest. <laughs> it's, not, it's definitely not mid-August. I get to the point right now where it's really difficult to not repeat myself. And that's that's mm-hmm. what I'm going to try and do. We're, we're going to go through some stuff that if you're a regular listener to this podcast, you'd be like, all right, Connor, we've heard you talk about your opinion on why you think the AM offense is going to be improved, why there could be some skepticism about all the LSU love. You've heard me say these things throughout the offseason. So what I struggle with at this point of the year is trying to be original with what I'm saying. But mm-hmm. mid-August is not my most favorite, but I do like that we are two weeks away from football. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I think mid mid to late September is my favorite. I I oh, man. love it. You get teams mm-hmm. riding the high off like a three and and0 favorable non conference mm-hmm. slate. Everybody still thinks, oh, there's that little bit of hope. You get that Friday in late September where you're like, man, there. The, you look at the slate for Saturday. It's starting to get a little bit cooler. Not here down in Central Florida, but like just <laughs> generally in the world, it's starting to get a little bit cooler. And you just think to yourself. This is this is peak right now. This is fun. Everybody's feeling good. So yeah, I think mid to late September is my favorite. What about you? That is actually I, I didn't think about that. This is why I asked. That's the correct answer because my argument for now being so high is everyone has hope, but mid September is all time hopium because you know let's say you don't or let's say you do have a week one game like Florida last year. By this point, they were like we might make some noise in the East. You know what I'm saying? So that three and oh like teams that fall off a cliff like we all remember. Um, was it West Virginia? And of course, I'm I'm now playing. Oh, Gino. Whenever Gino was with West Virginia, and he was throwing like six touchdowns a game, and it was like oh my gosh, like that era is so undefeated. When you're like this might like there's. 40, 50 teams that legitimately think this could be our year in mid-September. You're totally right. Yeah, and then you see the tweet from Matt Brown of The Athletic. A reminder that there's only been four teams who have been the AP number one since November 8th, I think it is, of 2015. Think about that. Mm. <laughs> Alabama, LSU, Georgia, Clemson. That's it. Those are the only teams that have held that number one ranking. But Hopium, it springs eternal. And so you always got to be a bummer, Connor. You got to be like, actually, your hope is pointless. At the end of the season, we know clubs it's going to win. You're going to be watching Dabo lift another trophy. All right. It is, it is not pointless. <laughs> there is a reason that we talk about all the teams and we talk. We don't just talk about the teams that are competing for a national championship. And something that we pride ourselves on this podcast is being able to dig into some interesting storylines because, man, there are some teams that go seven and five or shoot, even five and seven last year where you can't tell me A&M wasn't super interesting near the end of the mm-hmm. season so we don't kansas man that. kansas whenever Jalen was healthy kansas was awesome and then six and seven happened but hey number two yep. in the country in percentage of returning production that's a good thing for kansas positive vibes only we're gonna do the west crystal ball today and then we have matt hayes coming on we're gonna hit on a bunch of different things and then we're gonna end with budgeting and figuring it out so my sec west crystal ball If you want the team-by-team breakdowns, we are rolling these out one day at a time on SDS. We started them on Monday, so by it depends on when you're listening to this. If you're listening to this over the weekend, they'll have already been out. But there are one. There's one crystal ball per day. We'll be doing the East next week. It's something that I've been doing for about seven years now. And as much as I kind of agonize over it, it really forces you to decide how you feel about a team. You can say that you really like a team. And then you sit down, you look at the schedule, and you're like, yikes, I have them going seven and five. I guess I don't Mm -hmm. really like them as much as I thought. And it's also why I tell everyone who questions my projections, not like, oh, how dare you question me? Like, no, like, of course, you should question me. It'd be weird if you didn't. But what I recommend everyone should do is sit down, full SEC schedule, every SEC team, and just go game by game. And you'll realize not everyone can go 10 and 2. It's really difficult. Don't just do your own team. Because that's not fair. If you're just doing a projection mm-hmm. of your own team, oh, this this projection, this projection, they're going to win this game here. To me, that's not that's not the full way to do it. You have to be able to break down at least a full conference if you're going to do these things. Um, do everyone and just fill it out like an NCAA tournament bracket. Put it away. Put it somewhere in safekeeping. Come back to it in a few months and just kind of see how you did. And a reminder, these preseason predictions, even though they are game by game, I tend to focus more so on the big picture, what I have a team getting to, 
where a team think where I think a team is going to finish in the division as opposed to like the specific games because I might say something in August like oh I think LSU loses to AM. It, it doesn't mean that's what I'll be saying in late November, which that can come back to bite me. Two years ago, I had AM beating Bama in my preseason crystal ball, and then the week of that game comes, AM is reeling. They're coming off consecutive losses. I bail out of the pick. Don't you know it? AM winds up beating Bama. Your boy mm-hmm. doesn't really get credit for that one. But I like to circle back to the crystal ball at the end of the regular season just to kind of see how I did. Usually I'm off by like a game or two. LSU, I was very off last year. I went back. Well, I looked Me at Me too, buddy. <laughs> if you were on about LSU last year, kudos, kudos to you. I pulled up my LSU crystal ball because I was like, man, I really just felt like I was off about this team the entire year because I had them going seven and five. Three mm-hmm. and five in SEC play. Obviously, they end up going. Uh, they they end up having a regular season in which they're nine and three and win the West, of course. But where where I was really bad was the game by game how they got there. Mm-hmm. I only picked four of their twelve regular season games correct, and three of those games were like cupcake non conference games. <laughs> so bad. I was so off on all things. LSU. So, um, yeah, I mean, even sometimes if I'm like, oh, I was like a game or two off. If you actually like dig into it, I can be really, really off on what that path looks like. So does that? Oh, all I mean, in fairness to you, LSU lost A&M and beat Alabama. Um, and they lost to FSU, too. And the funny thing is, like, I was I actually remember that specifically. I had them at eight wins. You had them at seven. Our disagreement was the Mississippi State game, which I attended. And I was like, aha, I was right about this. And then. Everything else happened the way it happened, which was obviously good. Lead blew the fourth. Right, that's the other thing is you could argue that's actually a really good point. That is probably that fourth quarter is where LSU probably turned their season around because after that it was you know Florida, Ole Miss, da da da. da. Now we don't need to talk about the Tennessee game, all right? But either way, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, But like, like in terms of the offense, like kind of working. But yeah, I think uh, point being, I we were we were like one game off, but that that was just a weird team. So I think you should beat yourself up too much. Okay. I still will though. Just that's that's the nature of the beast. And a reminder, just and, and the difficult thing to do sometimes with these is if you do like the game by game stuff, you can tell yourself that you think one team is better than the other. Doesn't mean that you mm-hmm. have to you gotta pick you gotta be able to pick some upsets in here. Can't necessarily just have like chalky, like, oh, the team that is that I have third in the in the West is going to be the team that's fifth in the West. And like that's just the way that it works out. Um, mm-hmm. okay. So this is my projected order finish with overall record and conference record. Mm-hmm. Seventh, Auburn, six and six overall, two and six in the SEC. Sixth, Ole Miss, six and six overall. Didn't think I'd be there. Two and six in the SEC. Mississippi State is fifth, eight and four, eight and four overall, four and four in the SEC. At fourth, I have Arkansas, eight and four overall, four and four in the SEC. Third, AM. Here we go. Nine and three overall. This this, this is it. This is like my ultimatum for AM. Like I'll, I'll get there. Jesse Simonson has the same sort of ultimatum with the Aggies this year. I'm on board with that. Uh, nine and three overall, five and three in the SEC. LSU second, nine and three overall, six and two in the SEC. And then first, I've already talked about this a lot, but Bama at 11 and one overall, seven and one in the SEC. Will, when you initial reaction, when you see that, what stands out? Um. Okay, well, if we have the Connor Jinx going on, this means I feel better than ever about LSU winning the West. Yep. Um, however, yeah, I, I'm I'm about right there with you. I probably would. I probably I think Alabama and LSU will be neck and neck. I think that's where a lot of the polls went. But yeah, I, I honestly, it would be hard. I think you're higher than Mississippi, higher on Mississippi State than a lot of people. As yep. much as I love what they're doing there, I would probably flip Ole Miss and Mississippi State. Um, as we've talked about, Captain Chaos for sure is Hugh Freeze and Auburn. We could see it would not be insane. Okay, insane. Okay, for Auburn to win eight or nine games. Now, is it likely? No, but same thing with Brian Kelly. You know what I'm saying? Like Brian Kelly comes in. And if I told you, Hey, they would finish with 10 wins. You'd be like crazy, insane, not going to happen. Who freezes that type of offense in mind? So could I see him, you know, beating up on the Ole Miss, Mississippi state, Arkansas, maybe even A&M and sliding up to the middle? Yes. But would I pick it? No. Yeah. It's, it's not crazy. It's not crazy. I'm going to get to some Auburn things a, a little mm-hmm. bit later on, because I actually, I came away from that projection being like, man, I, 
I feel like I'm just going to be too low on that. And it wasn't necessarily my intention, but when you kind of break down the schedule and look at the way that it plays out, it does make a little bit more sense to me. Um, oh, it makes Auburn being good makes no sense. It's literally just betting on Hugh Freeze. There's no logic behind why they would be good. You know? No, that's fair. That's perfectly fair. I have Bama's one loss coming to LSU. <laughs> I have Bama losing at home to LSU. I look. I'll, I'll even go more bold. I, I will. I will say, Jaden Daniels goes down with the first quarter leg injury, prompting Garrett Nussmeyer <laughs> to come in and sling it all over the yard. And ends up being like just a tough day for Caleb Downs, true freshman Bama, who I think is going to have a phenomenal career, preseason freshman All American. Um, but I, I think that LSU goes into Tuscaloosa and wins that football game. I have LSU just going on an absolute roller coaster. Will like th- tell me how this LSU season would make you feel? Okay, oh boy, two September losses, one to Florida State, one to Ole Miss, a victory. Oh. Yeah, we're gonna get, we're gonna get a little bit spicy with that one, but I have I have a reason for that. A okay. victory in Tuscaloosa to regain control of the West, and then a home loss to A and M to close the regular season and miss out on repeating <laughs> as West champs, which LSU has never repeated as West champs since divisions became a thing. Is that complete and total disappointment, or is that an outcome that wouldn't necessarily be the end of the world? I hate how much sense this makes. <laughs> I hate how much this is the most Brian Kelly crap ever in it. I mean, literally, yeah. I, okay, FSU were both pretty like fifty fifty on that. I I got it. I got it. Just as a homer pick LSU, but we're both really like high on FSU. I think they could go two and zero in that series. It wouldn't be surprising. They're a good team. You know what I'm saying? I was maybe too high on them in the last podcast. People have been letting me know. But point being, yeah, you're gonna have a random SEC loss for sure. I feel you. We don't know if it's gonna be Arkansas. Auburn, LSU is a candidate to lose to Hugh Freeze. Like that, for sure, Brian Kelly gets tight. He kind of gets that same vibe he had the Arkansas game, but Hugh Freeze is just like, hey, who who better than us? We're chosen today, all right? Don't step up, step in, whatever he's going to say. I don't know. He he makes up his youth pastor phrases as he wakes up in the morning. Uh, but but he might just – that I could see – I actually hate how, how logical that is. Let me just say that. Okay, so – my, my biggest West upsets are very LSU heavy, and I'll only include the ones with a West team winning, and I'll save the crossover upsets with like an East team winning against a West team or something like that for the next pod that we do. Mm-hmm. Ole Miss beats LSU in Oxford. That's the only home dog that I have of these. I got six upsets in here. The rest are the rest we're all talking about road upsets, road team going in and winning this game. Uh, LSU mm-hmm. beating Bama and Tuscaloosa. AM beating LSU in Baton Rouge to spoil the West. Arkansas beating Ole Miss in Oxford. Mississippi State beating South Carolina in Columbia. And then Mississippi State beating AM in College Station. Let's talk about the, the biggest one there is probably Ole Miss beating LSU. I'm going to get a lot of pushback on that. I already have. Fine Bomb gave me a little bit of pushback on that as well. And I'll get into some of the LSU stuff with Matt, who is even higher on LSU than I think the average person. Um, the timing of this matchup is horrible for LSU. It is horrible. We need to talk about the fact that in September, LSU faces four Power 5 teams who had winning records last year, and three of those games are away from home, Will. That last game and that five-game stretch to start off in September is at Ole Miss. I wonder if coming off a game in which <sighs> they've got to stop Rocket and KJ for 60 minutes, they struggle to bounce back, and handle Quinshawn Judkins and the tempo of that Ole Miss offense. And it's just the timing of that. People forget, like, Ole Miss was leading at halftime of that game in Baton Rouge last year. As much as that was, you look at the final score, and you're like, you look at what Ole Miss became, look at what LSU became. Oh, that wasn't close. Like, Ole Miss was doing some things in the first half of that game, and then Jackson Dart throws that pick in the the end zone early in the second half when it's 24-20. Phenomenal play by Joe Fouché, but it was was an ill-advised throw that he shouldn't have made in the first place. And mm-hmm. that game totally follows a different script. Um, if you flipped the Ole Miss and Mississippi State games for LSU, I would have LSU getting through September 4-1. and one. I would. But hmm. I, I just I wonder about the timing of that because it would be really nice if we knew Mason Smith's going to be able to play 50 snaps by that point. Maybe – I don't know if he's going to be a 50-snap guy because it's, it's kind of hard to say with what mm-hmm. his role has been and obviously the injury last year. But I just question if he's going to be ready for that by that point of the season when they could really use him. They already had the the ankle issue in practice, kind of a brief scare. 
Kelly's like, we're really going to be conservative with him. You got to take it slow with his reps, which means I we could see another instance in which Makai Wingo's out there for like 80 snaps or something. I think mm-hmm. he led FBS defensive tackles in snaps last year, which is crazy. I mean, that you would think like, oh, LSU just rotates guys in and out on the defensive line. No, I don't have to worry about they that. They had nobody. <laughs> it's a freshman. And yeah. we're assuming, we're assuming, okay, they're going to be better at that area. I wonder if they don't necessarily have that quite figured out just yet, and that ends up hurting them in that game. And it's just the timing of it. I don't think Ole Miss ends up being a better team or anything like that because obviously mm-hmm. I'm going two and six. But I think that's the one that kind of makes everybody go, whoa. Any any given day in the SEC West, something like that can happen. Do you know what this would also possibly be on mm. the Ole Miss side? It would be Lane Kiffin's first win over a Power 5 team who wins nine regular season games since 2011. Mm. I think it would be the best win of the Kiffin era. I like. I mean – Think about that. Mm-hmm. Maybe the Indiana, the Indiana win, something like that. Listen, I was about to bring up his current best win as an Ole Miss head coach, the Indiana Hoosiers. Thank you. Yeah, um, this this I think would definitely supplant that. I, I think you would, you would have a clear case. But how how much that would that would shake things up to have LSU preseason darling staring at two losses by the end of September, only one of which would be an SEC play. So in theory, like LSU would still have a path to be able to win the division, win the conference, and get to the college football playoff because the SEC is an automatic bid, okay? They they just – let's call it what it is at this point. When your conference champ plays in a national championship 16 of the last 17 years, yes, you have an automatic bid to Mm – 16 of the last 17? Is that it? Yeah, 16 of the last 17. Yeah, you have an automatic bid. So a two-loss team like LSU, just like last year, would theoretically still have a chance. Wait, hold on. Give me that stat again. Oh, you said plays in. Okay, my bad. Yes. My bad. My bad. Sixteen of the last seventeen SEC champs have played in a national championship. Mm-hmm. With I was gonna say, I was gonna talk about Bama, but then I was like, wait, Georgia was in that game; they just didn't win it. Okay, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Two thousand fourteen Bama is the lone who did not make it to the SEC championship or make it to the national championship because they yeah. lost to Ohio yeah, State yeah, yeah, yeah. in the semifinal. Um, okay, so thoughts on that before I move on to the Ole Miss side of that? Any anything? No, that, yeah, that same, I. I think, you know, like you said, you got to pick something. It's like where everybody was giving you, you know, mess last year for having to pick a Georgia loss. It's like teams don't just go. I mean, credit to what Georgia's done. It's very, very rare for a team to do what they've done. So, yeah, it's like you kind of had to read between the lines and try to find one. And then, of course, when they didn't lose that game, it was like, ah, how could you think that? It's like every, like, Bama team finds a way to, like, either almost lose or actually lose to, like, not that great of a team. Usually, you know, like a team worse than Bama, which is every team pretty much. Um, so it's like, yeah, LSU is like in a kind of a similar place where it's like they're, especially if you factor in that they could beat Bama, it's like, yeah, you're going to have end up losing to at least, you know, hopefully not, but the team that beats them, if they beat Bama is going to be worse than them. So it's which one, right? It could be Arkansas. I'm, I don't know why, but something about that game makes me feel good. I, maybe I'll, I'll put that on the internet later. But uh, yeah, I think that, you know, and like we talked about, the, 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 the script is very similar where Brian Kelly gets tight. You know, first half, Brian Kelly is not that great of a coach. But somehow last year in that third and fourth quarter, they started cooking and getting loose. And so hopefully they improve on that. But yeah, there are plenty of head coaches or like play callers in the SEC that could really jump on that this year. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I do think LSU will have moments where like this team is – as good as there is, they have national championships upside. And then you're reminded of, man, what it can look like in, in a given week. And I think the Ole Miss game ends up being one of those. So why then am I not higher on Ole Miss? Why do I only have them going two and six in SEC play? Because that's that would be like, oh, man, you just paid Lane Kiffin all this money. You joined the $9 million club. That would be a really, <laughs> really tough pill to swallow in year four. Uh, three reasons here. I've got skepticism that Jackson Dart is suddenly just past the turnover issues and that he's just going to start looking like that dude against quality competition. I don't think he's about to be 2021 Matt Corral, despite all the optimism this offseason. And look, I've already done the 180. I said he's going to win the starting job. He is Spencer I was about Sanders. to say, what are the vibes there? Because I thought that was still an open competition. It's still, still considered an open competition. The offseason that he has had, I would be stunned. And, and I talked about this a little bit a couple of weeks ago, like coming off of media days. I heard more that Spencer Sanders was going to transfer a, a, as opposed to like he's going to win the starting job, which again, oh. he gets in a fall camp and he's and, and, and he's, he had to like come out and I think he told on three, like, yeah, I'm going to, to fall camp. And there was like a, 
a question about whether or not he was going to be that guy. We got, we got hmm. what we got in the background going on. Bill? Oh, that's boo. My cat's deaf and she's, oh, just, okay. she's addicted to sink water. We put, we took her to the vet and they gave her sink water and now she's a fiend for sink water. So if you don't give her sink water, she just freaks out. Anyway, I thought you had a small child in the background. I was going to say, like, I thought I was hearing it out of my headphones. I was like, is that Claire? Just like making a fuss. No, right now. you're watching my low maintenance cat. Walter just runs, walk circles around me being a chonk while I'm talking to you. And he's not making a peep. And of course, boo is, downstairs just screaming sorry just have having a day um have okay day. so <laughs> Ole Miss um I look I I think that Ole Miss is going to get into some of these some of these obvious passing situations in which Dart's going to struggle that's that's the the thing that I I have questions about I think Lane is going to be able to work with him I don't think that he's going to regress or anything like that Jackson Dart's going to be a better player this year he's going to be and I think Lane did a really nice job of surrounding him with group of five studs at the pass catcher position Zakari Franklin Trey Harris Caden Prescorn, the tight end from Memphis he's going to help out a lot in the red zone which was a well-documented area of struggle for Jackson Dart but I just have this lingering fear that Judkins is not going to be able to stay healthy for the entirety of this season. I worry about that. I don't like predicting injuries or anything like that, but he took on so many carries last year. He averaged 21.1 carries per game. Last time a true freshman power five running back averaged 20 carries in a, in a game, 20 carries for an entire season, AJ Dillon, Jonathan Taylor, 2017, like power five true freshmen do not get that kind of work. And he earned it. I mean, the mm-hmm. Herschel Walker is the only SEC true freshman who had more rushing yards than Quinshawn Judkins. I look at the the history of those guys, those stud freshmen. It feels like we're always talking about not just like the sophomore slump, but getting banged up. It, it happened to Chubb. It happened to Gurley. It happened to Lattimore. All three of those guys, you're like, ah, they missed multiple games as sophomores. And you're just like, man, what could have been? It, it felt like we, we just didn't get that piece of their career when they were set to take that next step. So I worry if that makes it really difficult in the second half of the schedule for for Ole Miss. The other thing, the last thing, the Pete Golding hire. It's it's fascinating, and I don't blame Lane for making it. I, I on the surface, I like it. Look, I get him to a place where he's not heavily scrutinized. Get him a, a clean slate. I, he's going to be capable of succeeding there because of the expectations you're going to a place where they haven't had a top 50 scoring defense since 2015 but here's what i worry about each of the last two years bama was among the nation's 20 most penalized teams at least in terms of penalty yards how's it bama that, that's, that's, that's so funny and people just pretended that didn't happen too not us but people were just nick saban well coached keeping those boys in line then you watch the games and be like these guys are not only making lots of penalties but they're very unclutch like they're the exact penalties you don't want to have and people are like oh you know bad people just like you know the refs have it out for them and it, look whatever if you want to break it down like game by game i guess conspiracy theorists can throw that out there but like it was a two-season deal this isn't just like a Mm one-season thing and no that's not all i'm not throwing that all on pete golding and obviously some some of that comes back to saban some of it comes to bill o'brien some of it comes on the players obviously but i just wonder if it's a struggle year one new scheme (sighs) they're gonna have a variety of looks i think that's that's gonna be the case but just remember last year, we're, we were praising Chris Partridge for the celebration at the end of the Kentucky game. I think he was lad of the week, actually, for that. Like, he's got... They, they fired my boy for Pete Golding. Look, they got to have a chonky defensive coordinator. That's the thing about Lane. He's got to have a little goofball over there. He could just place blame on with his team. You know, I don't like that. But anyway... <laughs> uh, how about this scenario? How about how about Golding is one and done, and he takes DJ Durkin back after DJ Durkin? Oh, my God. said at A&M. Could that happen? Uh, that'd be interesting. I'm not throwing that into the universe, but I'm just saying crazier things have happened. When, when that happened to Chris Bartridge, like we're like, hey, look, Ole Miss defense way better than we thought. How about them? They allowed at least 28 points in seven of the final eight games after that. Yeah. And not to particularly good offenses every single week when that was happening. So just wanted to throw that out there. That's kind of why I'm not as high on Ole Miss. And I'm, I'm definitely lower than the consensus on them. And I will not be one of those people that's like, saying Lane is about to break through and this is about to be a 10 and two season. Um, okay. and I'm buying, 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 buying most of it. I'm buying not every piece of A&M and every piece of Jimbo Fisher, but I'm buying it for the most part because I keep going back to this belief that I thought A&M had a championship window and this was supposed to be part of it. So that's going to be my default for some of this. The three losses I have home against Bama, 
at Tennessee. I think they get destroyed at Tennessee. Mm. I think that that game was a horrible, horrible situation for AM. Like they're feeling this, like if there's circle this one on the calendar, if there is potential for the Jimbo Petrino blow up or something like that, circle that one at Tennessee, not at home against Bama. But the one at Tennessee right after that, I think that's going to be brutal timing. Tennessee's coming off the bye week, and they're going to be like, "We're just going to run the football. I don't even care if Joe Milton can't complete a pass, you know, shorter than ten yards, and he's just throwing cannons out here. They're just going to have a three-headed rushing attack, and they're going to run all over them. And I wonder how that's going to look. And A and M just going to kind of just do whatever it possibly can to get to the bye week, and Tennessee will be in a much different place. So I think the timing of that one really hurts them. And then I think they lose at home against Mississippi State. And I'll get pushback on that one. Nobody's going to have that in the preseason projection. That's one of those where A&M fans, you're not going to find any A&M fan either that's like, oh, yep, home against Mississippi State, loss. But hmm. later in the season, Will Rogers, he's got more time to figure out that offense. He has been lights out against A&M the last two years. Everyone forgets that before A&M upset Bama in 2021, Rogers went into College Station he played his tail off. And that atmosphere, I remember Tom Hart was calling that game. And he's like, they were trying to will AM to a win that day. And they couldn't. Like, Will Rogers was too good. And that Mississippi State offense really kind of took off. And that was a nice run that he had in the middle of that season. So I say all that, being like, all right, nine and three, that would be a huge bounce back, most improved team in the SEC. But this is it, AM. This is it. This is this is the last, the last time that I'm going to do this for you. If you can't at least threaten, just threaten to get to a New Year's Six Bowl. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done with AM in the Fisher era. Okay. I, I am. I, if you don't give me that, this can't be seven and five. It, it just can't. You've got a defensive line full of five stars. You've got your most talented quarterback since Jameis, if you're Jimbo Fisher. You've got experience for days on that offensive line. You've got what's easily the best group of pass catchers since Jimbo has been at AM. And above all else, most important thing, you've got the right person running the offense. It's Robert Patrick Petrino, okay? You're number one <laughs> in the SEC in percentage of returning production. You're number seven. Robert national. Patrick Petrino. That makes this, him, he needs to rebrand. You're making me realize he doesn't need to be Bobby anymore. He's a grown man. He needs to be Robert Patrick Petrino. That sounds like a guy I would hire. It's a good Irish name, no? I mean, wow. I, I'm buying him. Look at that. I, look, Robert Patrick um that that guy doesn't get fired from any job he's yeah he's a lifer he he's yeah he's, he's got a gold loyalty. watch yeah loyalty stability <laughs> that, that's robert patrick okay yeah this, this, this bobby cat he'll, he'll get up and leave in the middle of the season he doesn't care right robert robert patrick is here for the long haul look if a&m is seven and five this year if that's it if mm -hmm. if, if we're talking about this team not competing for a division title at all. If we're talking about them just having no chance, no sense of relevance in November, this is this is bad. This is really bad. And I'll be done. I'll be done. That'll be it. No more of that. This is the last chance you get in them. Are you on board with that? Or are you like, no, seven and five is coming? Yeah, I mean, their defense um, was actually decently solid last year. Now, you could argue that they – Kind of the way they played offense uh, was caused the game to slow down. I totally get that, but you know they had the talent. Uh, now, were some of them speeding through parking garages? Sure, but at the same time, you know they had they had some dudes, and they I understand they lost a bunch of those dudes in the transfer portal. But I I think that their defense was underratedly like pretty solid at A and M. You know there were some games where sure they got gashed. But the offense was pretty roundly the problem. So all I'm saying is that that defense could actually become an asset then you can you won't i am not a dj durkin guy i've said it enough on here i get it but at the same time like it's it's not even about the offense it's about the offense when your offense is putrid you can't play complimentary football and that's pretty much sure. what happened last year so i think that you know they they could really actually kind of turn it around i think that uh, and turn it around for a and like we talked about. Texas 8-4 and four is like a lofty, we wish you could be Texas 8-4 and four right now. So if they get back there, you know, I think that's a win for Jimbo. As funny as that sounds, you know, he was hired to come in and win these national championships. But, hey, he was, you know, <laughs> unfortunately 7-5. and five. Should, have been, should have been worse than that, but he, he was. And uh, so point being, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that this, is, this actually weirdly could be a stepping stone year for him with like no expectations after how bad last year was.
I, I, I think they have expectations though. You know, I, I think as odd as odd as it is, like you, you see them in the preseason top 25 and you're just kind of wondering, you, you know, and I've talked to A&M people about this and how there's this belief that so much of last year could have been different if they had stayed healthy. And I, I'm a all right, man. That, that, like, <laughs> okay. They sucked well before they got banged up. Did injuries help them? No. But at the same time, you have the defensive line that you've wanted. You have these five stars up front. You have a Walter Nolan. Okay. Like you, you have a Shamar Stewart. Like you have these guys who are supposed to be your game wreckers. And this is what we talked about when you signed a historic class like you did a couple of years ago. And now is when they should be really starting to take off. So if that doesn't happen, it'll be a reflection of Jimbo Fisher. It'll be a reflection of DJ Durkin as well. And Durkin's one of those guys that I just kind of have my eye on this year. And I wonder, like, if they don't improve up front with all that talent, that that would be a terrible, terrible look for him. And because Jimbo's got $76.8 million left on that contract, that could be an easy fall guy. So there's something to keep in mind. But I haven't predicted to go 9-3. and three. They would be in New Year's Six Bowl territory, at least go into a Florida Bowl if that happened. I've explained as we know, you know, it was an injury that kept Anaya Smith out to start the year. So that's definitely injuries that were their problem. Um, anyway, so <laughs> point being, no, okay, let me ask you this question and then we'll be done with him. Is eight and four, is that disappointing? If they go eight and four this year, do you think they've, because I think that's fine. I think if they go eight and four, they're fine. You have them at nine and three. I think nine and three would be a pleasant surprise considering how bad they were last year. I definitely have said a couple of times, there's no reason why they can't get back to the eight and four jokes. <laughs> they, I love that so much. They should get back. To, they you have to at least get back to the eight and four jokes. But it depends. Mm-hmm. What what does eight and four include? Okay, because yeah. if eight and four is look, we're not on the same level as Bama and Tennessee. We get smashed at LSU to close the regular season, and that game has a much different feel than it did last year. And LSU flips the script on that, <laughs> and. Okay, you're beating up on lesser talented teams. You 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 beat your your Auburns, your Arkansas, your South Carolinas, your Ole Miss, your Mississippi State. Like, what are then? What are we talking about here? Are we talking about them getting to eight and four, having an offense that isn't painful to the eyeballs to watch, mm-hmm. or is this an eight and four year in which you're like you kind of look back, you're like they didn't really beat anybody that good. They didn't really take that next step. There was friction between Jimbo and 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 Robert Patrick. Like maybe maybe this year doesn't follow the eight and four of old, but I think that there's stuff within that eight and four that we would have to be able to break down to say whether or not it's a success or a failure. I don't know, man. When you play Tennessee cross division, eight and four in the SEC is eight and four in the SEC. There's not too many places to hide. But yeah, I think I I think we're pretty much on the same page there. Okay, the, the Bama stuff, I, I've explained a ton. Um, I find myself defending Bama. I, I have Alabama losing to LSU and then ultimately losing to Georgia in the SEC championship. So it's kind of weird to say, like, they're going to lose those two games. And I still think I'm higher on them than the average person, I've realized. Um, Better so, fans still going to be furious if that's how it goes down. Oh if they play Auburn close, buddy, they'll be asking for Nick's job. But think, <laughs> think about what a moment that could potentially be if they if they like they go into the Iron Bowl being like ah yeah we're probably not going to be going to Atlanta this year and then boom A and M pulls off the upset <laughs> beats LSU they Saban beats Freeze a little bit of revenge there I hate and, you you stop that right now uh, that's a, oh you're that's, saying if Freeze beats Saban at the same time that would be so oh, funny happened. oh if that happened oh buddy that would be that would be something um look hey first year coaches at Auburn. Given Pretty good. Fits. I'm just saying. You go back to the, you know, the, the overtime, overtime game. Band was on the ropes a couple of years ago. Could have halted the playoff chances. Yeah, <sighs> just, just throwing it out there. Um, yeah, but look, I, I think that getting to 11 and one for for this Bama team would still be getting back to joyless murder brawl. You're going to see this <laughs> offensive line take a step. That's what everybody's talking about, man. That's joyless the- murder. I'm sorry. I'm, okay, cool. Got it. That's- that's that's what everybody's all about. That is the phrase of the summer in Tuscaloosa. Mm. Look, if if they're getting to eleven and one, they're figuring out the quarterback situation. The running back depth is a huge, huge win. Kevin Steele shows that he is still relevant in the college football landscape. All of these things are happening, and we're saying Bama is a threat to win a national championship. Oh gosh, what if Bama gets in the playoff? That's what I think ultimately plays out for this regular season for the tie. 
Um, teams that I think will have a much better look to them down the stretch as opposed to early on. Arkansas and Mississippi State. Arkansas, I have starting one and three in SEC play. I have Mississippi State starting one and four in SEC play. But I think both teams with their scheme changes on offense, they end up looking much, much better down the stretch. A lot more difficult to play. Could end up being like, oh, hey, everybody's kind of written off. You know, KJ and the scheme change and Will Rogers, and it's it's taken a bit to get going. And then by the end of the year, you're like, okay, this is why you do this. This this is why you're you have a quarterback in that spot. And ultimately, their head coaches look better for making those changes, which you know weren't necessarily given. So I think that's how it kind of plays out uh, for them. But yeah, look, Auburn, year one with Freeze, um, that gauntlet to start is. I think it's the di- most difficult three game start that any SEC team has. You have at A and M, home against Georgia, at LSU. That is brutal, absolutely <laughs> brutal. The good news for Auburn, they should be starting off three and out. So you're gonna get to, you're gonna get some positive vibes. That trip to Cal. I mean, is there a Power Five team in worse position than Cal right now with all of their athletic department debt? Cal might get their uniforms repoed before that game, buddy. I don't know if that game could happen. Oh, God. I mean, they got to bring a a bondsman to that game to get that thing played. (laughs) Make sure they don't flee the country with all that debt. Yeah, I'm a I'm a Justin Wilcox appreciator, but that that one could be could be a bit rough. But you, you should at least get some of those moments that don't make you feel like this is gonna be just a kick to the teeth each and every single week. So that's the good news. Um, but you you know how I feel about the post spring quarterback transfers and Peyton Thorne is QB one. Justin Hokinson reported that today, four on three. I think it takes a bit for him to get his legs under him, and I and I think that that's just been the theme with these post spring quarterback transfers is like they're they're limited what they can do in the offense. We talked about it a lot. I know I I hate calling Jaden a full post spring quarterback transfer. He's kind of a mid spring quarterback transfer, whatever he was last year. But we mm-hmm. talked about it a lot with Will Levis and talked about it with Joe Burrow in that first year at LSU as well. And it's just also kind of hard to predict upsets for Auburn when we don't really know the Jarquez West Hunter situation. Um, here's something kind of related to that, not related to that. Brian Matthews tweeted this. Uh, the, all the the Auburn B people were on top of this. Like as soon as they saw this, uh, Garner Langlo left. He was like a second team offensive lineman. He left the team in fall camp. He's no longer with the team. One of those situations. Jack West Hunter is the last remaining member of Brian Harson's 2021 class still at Auburn. Oh my yeah. gosh, that that sucks. And you think about why that that could hurt this team. That's those are year three guys like pre-draft guys who've had multiple years in the strength program. And instead you, you, you're just not going to have that depth necessarily, which look, that's why Hugh freeze was so active in the portal. He's done a Mm -hmm. really, really good job of elevating that floor, but I think depth is going to hurt them. They're going to take their lumps in sec play. So as tempting as it is to be like, ah, Hugh's going to catch somebody. And you know what? He very well could, he very well could. If he goes into a and M and pulls off an upset, to kick off his return to the SEC. You talk about the ultimate chaos scenario. That might be it right there. And what AM fans would be saying about Jimbo and what they'd be saying about Robert Patrick. I mean, that would be, oh God. I'm now I'm just <laughs> I think now I'm regretting not putting that in there just to see what would mm-hmm. unfold. The college football world would would melt down. I think that is the ultimate chaos SEC opener scenario as I as I look at these slates, but yeah, it could be a lot more downs than ups year one with a much different feel heading into year two. As long as they can get to a bowl game, who knows? You get to a bowl game, you win the seventh game, get to the Liberty Bowl. Hugh Freeze, you know, Memphis guy, getting to the Liberty Bowl. <laughs> He's coming from Liberty. Makes a lot of sense, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, Will, any other thoughts yeah. on that? I, I'm Yeah, I'm looking here. Like you said, this out-of-conference schedule is like pretty, pretty busted. We're pretty terrible. So, like, yeah, they could kind of – and that's one of those things, like, with Cal. Is I feel like Cal played it close to Little Miss a couple of years – like, well, uh, five, five or six years ago at this point. So, like, you just never know what you're going to get out of Cal. They were, had a really solid defense, like, like three or four years. Like, they're just kind of this up-and-down team. They don't pay enough attention to, honestly, to even – but you just never know. So, I'm not going to fault them for 
you know, playing at Cal for sure. I think that could be a game that, you know, you just never know, but it's not going to be good this year probably. Um, yeah, so I think you have like off rip, yeah, like four winnable games and you got Vandy on the schedule. So like not to disparage them because that's that's a, a, a game that Vandy is probably going to be like, hey, this could be another potential for an SEC win for us. That should be a good game. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the path for Auburn to at least be a little bit better than last year is very easy. The schedule, I mean... <laughs> As a, knowing that you have to play Alabama and Georgia, this is about as easy as the schedule. Well, and LSU, those teams are on the schedule, right? Nobody's happier for division realignment than Auburn. Uh, but knowing those guys are on the schedule, this is about as easy as a, as a schedule can be. I will say quickly, uh, who is this UMass AD that just keeps getting on the schedule of SEC teams? Is this like a hidden Bowden or something that just knows everybody? Because we've seen them play, what, A&M, Mizzou, Auburn. I feel like there might be another one that I'm forgetting. Who is this UMass guy? <laughs> I don't know. That's that's a good question. And that's that's one of those games that SEC teams are really fortunate. They don't have to say this is an FCS opponent because technically right. UMass is FBS, but you're like, are they really? Are, are, are they, they really? Yeah. I don't know. Because uh, look, that game last year at a and I think that was up there for the single most painful to watch games that any sec team took part in last year mm-hmm. like that's that's number one i didn't do that postseason and i should have the five games oh that made that's us a good wish, <laughs> the five sec games that made us wish we were doing literally anything else that would have been the top lsu arkansas <laughs> no no what no i because harold perkins oh because that was so all fun. just yeah that's a good point yeah that was the no, harold perkins show that now, now I'm just thinking about all these crappy games that we had last year and what could have made that list. But yeah. UMass, come on, UMass, Don Brown, you know I'm not a big Don Brown guy. Uh yeah. <laughs> there will be there will be opportunities to be had for Peyton Thorne uh when Auburn gets to face UMass, despite what AM did in that slop fest last year. Any other overarching thoughts? West Crystal Ball, it's out there. Tweet at me. Tell me how much I suck. Comment on all of the individual crystal balls um, that are up on SDS right now. Yeah, no, I think that's good. I think I'm all good on that. All right. Um, we will do, like I said, we'll do the East next week and we'll get into some of these upsets. little teaser. I've got, I got Vandy winning an SEC game. I haven't done that. I haven't done that in a minute. And I, I have Vandy beating a non Mizzou team. There's your, there's your teaser for next week. Okay. Okay. We're, we're, we're going to get, we're, we'll get a little bit spicy with, with some of the East upsets that we got. All right, let's kick it to Matt Hayes. Talked about the late Alex Collins, uh, why Florida state spot is so unique and how it relates kind of to the, the future of college football realignment. Talked about his LSU love. He is very high in LSU, a little bit of the, the Michael Orr saga. And, uh, then an interesting nugget that I found out about the Manziel family at the end. So here's Matt. Now excited to be joined by a very special guest. It is my SDS partner in crime, Matt Hayes. Matt, it's been a minute. Um, not by design. I actually wanted to have you on after the tragedy that happened with Ryan Mallet, and then scheduling issues couldn't right. really set it up. Go figure that instead of recording after the death of Ryan Mallet, we're recording after the death of another Arkansas legend, Alex Collins. You had a great piece up on SaturdayDownSouth.com. Everybody should go read it. You talk to Bielema about Alex Collins. Hate to start on a somber note, but what did Bielema tell you about him and, and his legacy and what he meant to, to the people of the great state of Arkansas? Uh, loved him. Just absolutely loved him. Gave me some great anecdotes about his time there. Um, I can still remember going there in 2013, and I was in Brett's office. And, of course, we're listening to Bob Marley, and he's you know got flip-flops on. It's just the Brett, you know, the Brett that we all know and love. And I started asking about Alex Collins, and he goes, "Well, hang on, I'll bring him. You can ask him yourself." So Alex comes in, and, and I, you know, I start asking him why he went there. You know, why would a kid leave South Florida and go halfway across the nation to Arkansas? That's a long way from Miami to Arkansas. Um, and he says, "Did you fly in?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "Then you saw what I saw." You know, and, and you know, he's he's like the people are unbelievable. Um, it's a beautiful place. I love Coach B. He puts guys in the NFL. Why would I not come here? Um, you know, and he was getting away from some stuff in South Florida, too. Like, he um, didn't live with his parents for a while. He was living with his high school coach at one point. Um, Bielan was perfect for him. It was just a perfect coach for him to kind of get him on the on the right path. Um, Brett's one of those guys. He's a rare football coach. He's He invests in these guys, man. He's, he's big about who they are and what they are away from the field, uh, almost more than football even. Um, 
and that's what I love about him. And, and he really invested in Alex, and um, you saw what Alex did, three straight years of 1,000 yards, first back in SEC history to have over 100 yards in his first three games. Um, just, I mean, just a, a great player, but the thing Brett kept saying was, man, away from football, Matt, you wouldn't believe how the the community just, I mean, they loved him, and he loved Arkansas. You know, it was a great quote where he said, man, he was all pig suey. Um, he loved it. It's 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 a tragic story, man. I mean, the the most telling anecdote, and, and believe me, Brett choked up like two or three different times while we were talking over about 15 minutes, and he said, you know, when Alex first got here, you know, back then there was no NIL, but they got Pell Grant money. So he got one of his first Pell Grant checks. One of the first things he did was bought a motorcycle. And he didn't have a license, didn't know how to drive it. And he said, I had to tell him, Alex, park that thing. Until you get a license, until you take lessons, and you figure out how to ride that thing, I don't want to see you on it. He said, you know, the foreshadowing of that now is just too hard to even think about. And it's, yeah, just really, really unfortunate. It just breaks your heart hearing stuff like 28, that. 28, man. Golly. And, yeah. and go figure, it was kind of on the heels of that, like, weird Sony Michelle death rumor, too. And yeah, also, yeah, yeah. Like, it's and crazy. We, and we've become a bit numb to this, too. And I, I'm guilty of this. And I, and I only realize it. it's a shame when, when something like this happens. Of Man, he kind of had an underappreciated season because of what happened in the SEC that year. Arguably the best oh, season yeah. Ever for SEC running backs was 2015 with Derrick Henry with Leonard Fournette, and he's like kind of the forgotten guy. In any other year, we're like, oh yeah, that's that's first team All SEC, that's like All America worthy, right? And he kind of gets for guys. He's like the third best running back in his own division. I know that season. Such a it's- fun guy to watch play too, man. He ran so hard. Um, just you could always had a smile on his face, man. Always, always. Every time, every time, like he had his helmet off, the guy's smiling. Um, the entire time I talked to him in 2013, he was smiling, just just a a happy guy. Everybody always says that. Like you read the tri- the tributes on, can we still call it Twitter on X? Um, and just everybody saying, man, he's just the happiest guy, always smiling. Uh, it's unfortunate, just really, really tragic. Yeah, the RG three story I, I saw. I was reading. I was reading that a good extended look. It's it's who somebody is that that people you know like these the, the viral video of him doing the the Irish dancing and stuff. Right, like right. Man, this guy was this guy was full of life and and definitely was was a, a key piece in telling one of the I, I think interesting SEC stories of the 2010s and Brett Bielema. Um, okay, so on a on a very very different note. Something we've talked a lot about over the course of the last few weeks nationally, um, something that you've talked about on 1010XL, like Florida State, man. What in the world is next for Florida State? Because they put out the bat signal, and boy, uh, to think that they're in this spot, given what they were entering in the first playoff, and you could have probably said at that time, there might not be three or four programs in all of college football that you'd rather be right now than Florida State. And instead, they're entering the new era of this college football world with so much uncertainty as a result of this grant of rights deal. Where where in the world does Florida State go from here now that this deadline has passed? You know, first off, I I want to say this and be very clear about this. It's they don't have you know, there's what are they supposed to do right now? I I, I mean, I don't blame them for doing everything they're doing. I mean, they're in the middle of the South. And every major college football playing university is going to be making double what they're making. So I don't blame them at all for what they're doing. But at the end of the day, where are they going to go? Even if they break the grant of rights, which no one thinks is possible, where are they going to go? The Big Ten's not going to take them. The SEC is not going to take them. So then what do they do? And I've been saying this for I don't know how long. And I know Florida State fans are all upset about it, but – their best bet is to stay in the ACC, somehow figure out a way to either get out of that grant of rights or, or come up with a new conference that includes Stanford and Cal and, I don't know, maybe SMU, and try and get ESPN to redo the deal. I don't know how much more you're going to get because why would ESPN give you that much more for that? It, it, now, it does give ESPN the, the Saturday night windows, which is nice, which is a nice thing for them, but I don't know how much more they're going to get for that. But – when you do that, at least if you bring in those three, at the very least until 2036 ends, you can tell them, look, you're not going to get a full share. 
you know, if we make 34 million or 35 million, you're going to get 20. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that other 14 million. We're going to put it in our little kitty or whatever they're calling that thing, man. And, and the, the team that wins the league or the teams uh, that have, you know, those 4 million, uh, you know, uh, ratings games, then you get more money. That's how you, that's what they're trying to do right now. That's the idea of what they're going to do. Um, I, I think any way they can add more money to that kitty uh, instead of specifically giving it to Florida State, Clemson, North Carolina, and Miami, I think I think you're going to s- still keep everyone happy knowing they have a chance to get that money, Connor. But if you start singling out programs, then you've got the idea of the Big 12 when Texas was, you know, Texas and, and Oklahoma ruled the roost and where in the Pac-12 where the USC and UCLA were getting a different revenue share than the others. You can't do that. There's no. It's been proven. You, they've all got to be on the same level. Um, yep. That's how the why the SEC was so um, successful. Why the Big Ten was so successful. So I don't think you can do that. I I guess long story short, man, they've got to find a way to get as much money in that kitty to where they can say, look, Florida State, if you win the league, if you have X amount of you know four million games, you're going to get X amount of money, which then will allow them to kind of make up. Um, at least some of the difference between them and the SEC, and specifically their team they're going against, Florida, in, in the state of Florida. Is this a path for them? Because I, I think people hear you say the SEC and the Big Ten don't want them, and I want to I get to that part of this and why this is interesting. But how Florida State remains relevant is getting whatever sort of – I'm not advocating for this. I'm saying if this is a path, then could they pursue this? That Saudi-funded – pool of money hear me out on this and then pushing for that super league pushing for that super league in the middle of the 2030s and saying we are at the upper echelon of college football we belong in whatever sort of 20 team super league that that could be created and this record tv contract that could eventually come from something like that and i know that's really daunting and personally i wouldn't be a big fan of seeing that i love some of the regionalization of what's left but is that maybe the best path for Florida State? Just hope that in this next 10 years, they get that money so it's not every single year they have to worry about UCF making more money than them from a TV contract no. and know that that check is there, maintain relevance, and just get to the middle of the 2030s and hope for the best. So first I want to say uh, nothing will surprise me anymore, okay? Yeah. <laughs> nothing. And I mean nothing. Um, secondly, I will say this. It, and there, are, I've already had industry people tell me this that there's talk going around right now that if the SEC and the Big Ten combine their media rights deals, you know, once once these deals are done, these initial deals, which I believe they both end on, I think they both end in the same year or close to it, like in 2030, I think 2030, 2031. Something like um, that, yeah. If they combine their deals, I had two different industry people tell me this, it would be double what they make right now. Double. So – if you start, if we get to the point by in seven years, and I think we will be there a lot sooner than that, of paying players, pay for play, literally straight pay for play. I'm not talking about NIL. Um, if you get to that point, you're going to need more revenue. Um, the playoffs going to help. The playoff will probably be about $1.5 billion annually. The new contract, not the next two years. The next two years will still be on the old contract. It'll be given a little bit of a bump, but it's not going to be like the new deal. The new deal is going to be ridiculous, like $1.5 billion a year. So – you're going to need new money, right? New revenue streams. One of the ways is combining all, all of the major conferences. And here's the thing. Will the SEC and the Big Ten combine the TV deals? I don't think they will. I don't think the SEC would combine with the Big Ten, but it's possible. It's possible because they're on the same level. You're not going to combine the four power conference leagues and say X, Y, and Z. Now, hear me out. If, and I'm not even talking about the Saudis, forget the Saudis. If ESPN and Fox and CBS, um, TNT, whoever, you know, you get three or four and a couple streamers, you know, a lot like the NFL. If they say, we're going to pay you for the best 50 teams in college football, and we're just going to pay you a stupid amount of money, stupid amount, 10 billion a year, 9 billion a year, okay? Is that then tempting for those 50? Presidents, hell yes, it is. And I think at that point, then you might see, yeah, you might have this Super League that Gene Smith talked about uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, you might see this, this this Super League that a bunch of industry sources are talking about. 
Um, it's just a matter of how long the current conference structure stays viable. And I don't know how much longer it will be. I, I honestly don't. Because are you really going to leave Florida State and North Carolina and Clemson and Miami stranded in a dying conference? I don't know how you do that. I, I don't know. I don't know as a college football caretaker, which whether these presidents like it or not, that's what they are. I don't know how you do that. If you've already gone the major steps, Connor, of eating one of your own, which is what they did with the Pac-12, and, and you've already gone to the point where you now have a clear level of these are the big boys and these are the second tier guys who make half of them. How do you not at least say, OK, let's now do what's in the best interest of college football. And I, I don't know what that is. I don't know how many teams that is. I don't know who gets knocked out. Um, I don't know how difficult that conversation is going to be. But if you start throwing around nine or 10 billion annually, I mean, the NFL gets, I think it's 12 billion annually, right? Something like so that. So if, if you start throwing around eight, nine, 10 billion annually, you're going to get a lot of people going, okay, let's look at this before we start saying no. 50 is too big, though. I don't think 50. 50- makes those because it's going to take buy-in from it would take buy-in from the big 10 side the sec side because they look at their bottom line right now and they say why do we have to give into a super league we're getting our own crazy contracts sure you you don't have to worry about that at any point but like if that if that point comes and you would need those those conferences to join forces and then take you know maybe maybe there's a new big 12 power by that point and you're looking at, at, you know, maybe taking two from there and a few from the ACC, and then just saying we're going to throw it all in the middle. We're going to we're going to have this thirty-five team, you know, similar to the NFL model, and then this is kind of what it looks like. I think there are a lot of teams that are going to look at their contracts right now on the outside, looking in and saying that's our best hope. That is our best hope to stay relevant for the next 20, 30 years, and that's a terrifying thing. Like that is a really scary thing for college football fans because. I guarantee you those wheels are already starting to starting to turn. And that's the only way that you can kind of make up that deficit because the deficit is so significant. And it's why we're at this point in college football. And it's too bad right. but for schools like Florida state and Clemson. It's kind of reality at this point. So listen, so, you know, I, I have people ask me this question all the time. Well, if the NFL can travel, why is it so hard for college football to travel? It's not the football travel is not a problem. It's the Olympic sports. I almost think what they did, Connor, is they got ahead of themselves by ex- by expanding these conferences. What they should the, the expanded conferences shouldn't have been the expanded conferences. It should have been the football league that we're talking about. Then everybody else stays in their conferences, the Olympic sports, and they just play like that. And then football pays for you know everything else, like it always does. But you don't have these crazy travel issues for the secondary sports under football. And I'm including basketball, men's and women's baseball. I'm including all the sports. Football goes away by itself, still pays the bills, but goes away by itself as far as travel and stuff like that. Then you still have all the other conferences who are there and viable, and you have your way to have your NCAA tournament, to have your college World Series, to have your softball World Series, all of that. Um, You have your NCAA championships. Everything like that is still the same. I almost think they got ahead of themselves too much, and they started panicking, and they thought, okay, well, we need super conferences. And the reality is you don't need super conferences you need one big association, one big association, 40 teams, 50 teams, whatever you whatever you want to call it. That's what you need, football only. The rest of it is all the same how it always was. Uh, the basketball deal is too big, though. The, there, there's, they want that basketball piece, and football moves the needle. No, no it's realignment. the same thing. You're not changing anything. Basketball still stays the same. Like, you are literally not changing anything. All the conferences, as they were prior to this crazy realignment, so you go back, and the Pac-12 is still the Pac-12, Big 12 is still the Big 12, okay? But football is by itself playing at a different, whatever you want to call it, association, level, whatever. What you're doing with the rest of the sports, they're all still there in that conference structure, ACC, Big 12, SEC, Big 10. They're all still there. It's just football that goes away and plays by itself. Ideally, Yes. Basketball has become too big of a piece of the negotiating for having that midweek entertainment available and being able to say in the dead of winter, 
this this is part of this contract to have this team associated with this under this contract and oh cbs is gonna cbs knows that it can have these teams available and so because right. of the value that's there and because of what midweek sort of value that provides to them during a really tough time of year it's awfully difficult to leave basketball out of that conversation as much as football moves the needle with all of this stuff and no realignment move is being done for basketball but that's that's it's a difficult thing to figure out. And I, I would love to be able to go back and change a lot of these decisions because we'd get the original big East for college basketball. The ACC would be, you know, the ACC wouldn't be going through the, the changes that it's had to go through and perhaps more changes that are football related if grant of rights ever comes up. But yeah, it is a messy space to be able to, to navigate right now. Um, can we talk actual football things? We started with Florida state. How about the yeah. team that Florida state is facing my neck of the woods season opener. Do you have LSU winning a national championship? Uh, I, haven't, I haven't picked yet. Matt, are you, are you gonna try and let are you gonna try and let the cat out of the bag? Is that what you're trying to do? I, I've 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 read I'm a close. lot. I'm really, really close to picking LSU, I'll tell you that. Okay, what's what's holding you back from picking LSU? Because I can give you a few pieces of ammo that would about that would throw two weeks. a wrench in you. <laughs> about two weeks of time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um so let's let's I think there's a world in which, look, and I'm already on the record saying I don't think LSU wins a division title this year. I think they beat Bama this year. I don't think they win a division title. Wait, and stop right there. Stop right there. Who's playing quarterback in Alabama? At Alabama, I've been saying Ty Simpson. I'm sticking with Ty Simpson despite the fact that – So Ty Simpson is going to going to beat LSU. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying LSU is going to beat Bama. I'm saying LSU beats Bama in consecutive years. Did you hear me? Did, did it cut out? Now I hear you. Okay. Now I hear you. <laughs> Every moment here, I was like, is he, is he sitting there and stunned? I can tell you that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. No, I said LSU is going to beat Bama consecutive years. So Ty Simpson will will not, in fact, beat LSU. So who beats LSU then? So LSU loses two September games. They lose to Florida State in the opener. They lose to Ole Miss, which – Look, I'm already on record saying all of this uh, crystal ball series that people have already listened to the first part of this. And then they lose. All right. This one's going to get me in trouble. They lose the regular season finale at home to AM. and An A&M team that punched them in the mouth last year in College Station in their fake bowl game to be able to get to five wins. Um, and LSU goes nine and three, but beats Bama and gets to a New Year's Six Bowl. Am I crazy for thinking that? Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think I, – I think, um... I think they're really good on defense. They got so much better in the secondary. Um, they got legit guys that can Did cover. They? Did they? Yeah. Uh. They got Zion Alexander. They got Harris. They got little legitimate dudes that can cover now. Do they have Harris? Is that – are we sure about that one? Is he? Are we sure he's going to be on the roster? None of the team picture? Well, I'm just, just they got Alexander, there. who everybody wanted. Once he, once, he, once he finally said he's leaving Southeastern, everybody wanted that kid. So they've got him. He froze up again. No, we're good. We're 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 good. We're we're playing through it. We're playing through it. You're getting storms in Jacksonville. I'm jealous. We haven't gotten a storm here in Orlando in like two months. It's been brutal. The grass absolutely hates it. But um no, okay. I can't so even see you now. <laughs> we're playing through. We're playing through. All right, we're I, playing through. Let's the do secondary it. is the exact issue that I have with this team. And what does it look like if they can't get home? The issues that they could potentially have there. I'm not exactly sold on major burns in the way that some have to make him a preseason all SEC guy. And you just kind of wonder about the back end that was really put together by the transfer portal. And Kelly did a great job with that last year. But what does it look like if they can't get home, if they have a couple of those games where Harold Perkins playing that more traditional linebacker isn't necessarily disrupting things in the backfield. Mason Smith is only playing 25, 30 snaps a game. These, these are just questions that I'm throwing out there in what's a really difficult division still that I could see them having a couple of slip ups. Well, I mean, he first off, Harold Perkins is playing all over the field. Um, yeah. He, he's I, I, my guess would be on every third down pass situation. He's moving to the outside. Um, Spates is a legit Mike linebacker. So uh, I, I would say Perkins is going to be all over the place, all over the place. Um, I, I think they're going to get pressure. Um, you're forgetting about Wingo in the middle too. Wingo's a really good player. Stud. Um, yeah. So I, I, I mean, I, I, I really like them defensively. And I, to me, it's, I'm not worried defense. I'm, I'm more concerned about, 
does Jaden Daniels have that year two jump when you're, you know, year two in a system, um, year two with a team, year two of feeling comfortable in what you're doing and who you're with? Because if he has that jump and he becomes an even better throw, he almost he completed almost 70% of his passes last year. Now the ball's got to go downfield more. There's no doubt about that. But if he gets up to like the 74, 75% range and the ball's going downfield and he's that running threat, woo, they're going to be hard to beat, man. I, I agree. They that, are going to be hard to beat. I, I think they will be. And look, if, if LSU is sitting there with a second consecutive New Year's Six Bowl, second consecutive victory against Bama, the LSU fans should be feeling good because you're coming off. You were coming off of your worst two year stretch in the 21st century. It, you should <laughs> still be feeling all right. If you were sitting there going 10 and three in year two of the Kelly era, and I'm, you know, giving them a bowl victory, a new year six bowl victory. Like there are worse seasons, obviously that, that you can have if you're LSU. You've seen what that floor looks like, but there are just parts of it where I'm just like, man, I look at that schedule four of the first five games that they play power five teams with winning records you got to face Ole Miss in that week five game you got to go on the road and slow down Quinshawn Judkins you have difficult SEC West games obviously that we we all know about okay those those are obvious but I wonder about the grind of that schedule to start and how that looks and if they run into a couple of these close games where they're like man we're just not quite on that level and the one thing I'll say about about Jaden as much as I loved the transformation last year Mm mm-hmm is he in a spot where LSU fans would actually be more excited if they saw the backup as opposed to the starter? I mean, Tennessee might be another one of those teams, but if Garrett Nussmeyer stepped in, especially after what he did against Georgia in the second half of that game, and they saw the way that he ran this offense, like would LSU fans actually be like, Ooh, all right, now we're cooking with this. All right. The Georgia game was over. Okay. Let's, let's make, let's be very clear. Let's be intellectually honest about that. That game was over. So it's pretty easy to start throwing up. It's pretty easy to throw, you know, to throw up big numbers and against a team that's basically playing very soft coverage and knowing they just got to get out of the game. All right. Um, that's number one. Number two, I got three things to tell you. Number two, um, if Nussmeyer was a better quarterback, he'd be playing. No doubt about it. Brian Kelly is not a guy that fools around with quarterbacks. He wanna we went unbeaten in Cincinnati. They played three quarterbacks that year. So he he's not a guy who worries about the quarterback's feelings. And then the last thing I want to tell you, um, as far as LSU, when you say, well, they got to play this guy, they got to play here, they got to play there. I'm going to give you the old Spurrier thing, okay? When he was asked that one time, he said, what do you mean we got to play them? They got to play us. <laughs> and that's the way you got to look at it. If you're LSU, that's the way you look at it. They got to play us. We don't have to play them. Agreed. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on on a couple of things in the entertainment world, the ICC entertainment world, uh, before I get you out of here. <laughs> Uh, the Michael Orr thing, weird. Like, no winners yeah. whatsoever. Read the the Dan Wetzel column about it as well, in addition to the ESPN piece. Um, no winners whatsoever. This was a little bit before my time, before I started covering the SEC, really digging into this. Did you have any sort of, like, Michael Orr background about any of this? Or could you see any There's of no this, this coming? Or is this all news when this hit you? Because you keep freezing on me. There you go. Go ahead. All right, we're good. We're good. Okay, let me let me repeat the question. Let me repeat the question. Hold your antenna up, like you know. No, we're good. We're good. We're, we're, we're getting this figured out. Um, okay, the Michael Orr stuff when when all this dropped this week, the ESPN story. Um, right. I I didn't see any of this coming. I, I knew that there were some discrepancies in in what was going on with, like. You know, obviously, like some of the stuff that you that you've heard about the family over the years, are kind of like, ah, eh, maybe it wasn't exactly what the movie portrayed it, and you heard heard some of that as well. But to think that they're kind of at, at little legal odds is just kind of a baffling thing. The Dan Wetzel column kind of shed some light on that as well. Had you heard any stories about about any of this stuff in the past that there was some sort of rift between them, or that this wasn't exactly what Hollywood had, had kind of made it seem like? So. Let me, let me just say this, okay? What you saw and what you read and what was the big story uh, late last week was a filing. You can write anything in a filing, literally anything. And I mean anything. I mean you can write falsities, half-truths. You can write anything. You only have to prove it when you get actually in front of a judge or in front of a jury. So you can write anything. And that's only one filing we've seen. 
We haven't seen the response. We don't know what the response is going to be. I, I, when I saw that, I said, okay, it looks very odd, but I'm not jumping on that because I don't know what the, the, the response is going to be. You know, you've got the plaintiff out here who's saying X, Y, and Z, and we don't know what the response is. We have no idea what the other side of the story is. So I, I, I don't know. I, I do know that clearly they, I don't even want to say adopted him, but they, they took him in, right? They helped him from where he was. He was not in a good, a good place, clearly. My guess is they didn't see this big kid walking on the road and they thought, oh, let's make some money off this kid, you know? Um, I, I want to wait till everything's out there, man. I am not jumping to conclusions right now, specifically when you're talking about a former NFL player who, again, allegedly now is broke. And, and, uh, you know, again, I, I don't know. I, I want to see everything, I guess is the best way for me to put it. Yeah. Agreed. Just a bummer though, that like one of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Of is, course. Like, one of those cool stories. And then Such a feel good story. Yeah. 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 Um, speaking of feel good stories that we saw play out um, on our TVs, I, I teased this before we came on um, a little interesting nugget that um, I was alerted of. So is this the, what you're going to spring on me? What you said before we got on? Yeah, it's exactly what I All said. Right. Um, All right. Let's hear it. <laughs> so the Manziel doc on Netflix, right. uh, we reviewed it last week. Really interesting stuff. Uncle Nate's role was fascinating in it. I thought one of the revelations from it, was that he said that he made up the oil money thing, that the Manzels had gotten rich, had generational right. wealth from the oil stuff that was all made up as a cover-up for all of Johnny's spending that off-season going into the 2013 season. A very reliable person close to the situation informed me that Uncle Nate is lying about lying. And He's lying about lying? He is lying about lying and that the family had, quote, burned through that oil money. It was burning through it. And that there was that oil money. And then Manziel family had it. And that it had gone wow. through that money. But the lie, wow. the lie that Uncle Nate had told on the Netflix doc, where he's just like, yeah, I made it all up. We were led to believe that a certain, you know, even people like Wright Thompson were duped from this detail. Which, if you're, if you're duping one of the great journalists of our generation, not just sports journalists, but just all journalists, You've done something probably pretty extraordinary, but apparently, as I have been told, there are there's there's paperwork that shows the Manzel family did indeed have that money, and that no. this lie that was a huge revelation in the Netflix doc, one of the few untold things that were actually like whoa, was apparently the people the doc did not do their fact check in on Uncle Nate. This money did indeed exist. And Nate was doing this to make himself look good. Wasn't doing it to protect the family, from what I've been told, but was doing it to make himself look good and like he had a bigger role in this than than what he or, or that he, than he actually did. So I just thought I'd spring that on you. Little little interesting. Didn't Johnny nugget. addressed that. Johnny addressed it too in the in the in the documentary, didn't he? I thought yeah. Johnny addressed that too. Yeah. Um, you think he was playing along? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I, I really First off, do. the best part about it, the best part about the documentary, and this was after that too. There were two unbelievable spots when he said, right after the half game suspension, went right back to signing. That was <laughs> phenomenal. Okay, that was number one. And then number two was when he got to the Browns, and you know the Browns GM calls his agent and says, "Hey, Johnny's not watching game tape. What do you mean he's not watching game tape? He's, he has to watch something. No, zero point zero hours." And then they flash to Johnny. He goes zero. <laughs> How good must that cat have been in college football to watch no film and still do what he did? It's God amazing. My. It's, it's, it needs to be up there with the Bo Jackson. I didn't work out. I didn't go to practice. Like, all right, Bo Jackson, like, lifted weights and all that stuff. But like, well, Herschel yeah. never lifted weights, right? Yeah, Herschel, like, yeah, just, just Herschel never lifted. Herschel push-ups and sit-ups, right. <laughs> just, just did all this. It's, it's unbelievable. It's one of the, the feats of, of human history, if you ask me, that he got to that place. But, yeah. By the way, um, I'm not buying Herschel's push-ups and sit-ups either. No way. Oh, you're not? No you're, You don't do work like that with push-ups and sit-ups. No way. You mean that, 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 that doesn't <laughs> – Yeah, like, how do your legs get like that, man? Like – <laughs> Where's that all that car? You got legs like tree trunks. You, you don't get legs from like that from doing sit ups. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Right, right. None yeah. at all. Yeah. All right. Uh good stuff, Matt. Really appreciate yep. it. Hopefully, 
you're not, you know, in harm's way with a, a storm in Jacksonville or anything like that. And uh, yeah, we'll do this again real soon, man. All right. Figuring out, we're talking budgeting. Will, do you keep a budget for your finances? I, that's, that's a little bit redundant. Do you have a way to track your finances and stay on somewhat of a budget? Well, it's two separate questions. I track my finances. Do I stay to that budget? No, but I use this tool called, it's free. It's from Intuit. It's called Mint. So this is my one piece of advice and I'll give lots of bad advice or personal faults, I guess. Uh, I, if you, you actually love this. It takes, it analyzes your bank account and groups it into groups. So you food, utilities, all that stuff makes it into a pie chart. And then it, you can break it down monthly, you can break it down weekly, however you want to break, you know, that's like a, a sports reference for your finances. And then you could say, okay, well, last month I spent whatever, you know, on, on like my food budget was huge last month. How do I cut that down? So I love mint is free and that's cool. That's what I use. Do you find yourself beating yourself up or holding yourself accountable when you blow your budget out the water? Uh, depends on, on what I spend it on. I think that's the key. We have we have those moments, and Lauren does a fantastic job of of, of leading this. And I, I contribute, but not in the way that she I, she's sitting there with the spreadsheet, and we break it down by category, and we go through. We try and do it month by month. I mean, we do it month by month, but not necessarily at a specific date in the month. We'd like to be able to do mm -hmm. that, but there will be times where she's like, "Hey, I need two months worth of finances from you." And it's when she says two months worth of finances for me, she means like my credit card purchases because we have joint account and she gets all of our stuff um, from within that. And we have certain numbers that we try and not exceed for whatever it is that we're talking about. Like, oh, how much are we going to spend per month on groceries? How much are we going to spend on gas, you know, car insurance, you know, whatever. And we log it and we say, let's stick to it. And then when we kind of look back, we're like, oh, well, you know what? We had to, we had to buy like birthday presents for this person. Like, oh, you know what? We had like a visitor in town. So like we were going to mm -hmm. be eating, we we're going to be eating out a little bit more and stuff. So, you know, we couldn't necessarily stay on our budget there, but it's good that we at least track it, I think. Mm -hmm. But I've realized over the years that there are people who are so locked into their budget. Like my brother is really good at this and knows numbers very, very well has it down to um not like to the dollar and he's not he's not that guy that's has a budget and is cheap like he's not sitting there being like ah you know what i'm over my budget for something like hey can you pick this up he's not that guy and he's not like mm -hmm. oh i don't want to i don't want to do this because i don't want to like go out to eat because they're just in orlando i don't want to go out to eat because we're we're a little bit high on our, our you know in that area for this month He's not that mm -hmm. guy, but he does such a good job of tracking it. And I'm jealous. And I wonder how many people actually go through in that way. Because when you start getting money, and this is this is something that I didn't fully realize when I was until I was living with Lauren. When you get mm -hmm. money, there's nothing that's really telling you how to save. I wish we had financial literacy in high school. I wish we had more of it mm -hmm. in college, but if you don't set a budget, it can get messy in a hurry. And I think like for, for a lot of people, like first job, when you see some of those first checks rolling in, and I remember even just going to get like work clothes and being like, I can spend a few hundred bucks on this. And that's like, I think a pretty good investment in, you know, because it's the way that you're presenting yourself and stuff like that. But I had nothing that was sticking me to a budget, nothing that was telling me how I should be saving and doing that. So I, I'm very, very grateful that I married someone who's on top of that, who would like literally moved apartments out of her first apartment in Lafayette and moved there because she's like, ah, they raise rent like a hundred bucks or something like that per month. It was just like, yeah, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather be able to cut back on this now, work the second job as well, because journalists get paid zero money. But <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think that being in a relationship requires you to have a budget or is it something where like, yeah, that'd be ideal, but really it's kind of all about how you're wired and how you're wired as an individual. 
Yeah, dude, I actually think now that you say that being in a relationship, I, I think helps because I think you have another person who you're accountable to. You know what I'm saying? Like if I like <laughs> what made me think of this topic, I was in London and I just bought like a night helmet. <laughs> and I got here the other day. And I was like, bro, what are you doing? <laughs> it's cool it's super cool i love it but i'm like did you need that night helmet and i'm like if i you know whatever i'm not gonna go into my relationship. there are good parts and bad parts of my relationship but one thing is like i would not have bought that night helmet <laughs> the fact that you didn't show up the last two episodes wearing this night helmet swinging a miss on your part huge missed opportunity i mean it would be terrible audio but goodness gracious will that is we're, we're being look we're going to be more visual. We're going to have our episodes on YouTube. Like the mm -hmm. people need to be able to see this night mask. Yeah. When you're it's not a mask, it's a helmet. It's a helmet. It's a okay. Helmet. Okay. A helmet that nights wear. I'm only picturing That's... a football helmet. It must be middle of August no. or something. Yeah. You got to, you got to cover the face, you know, so you can get, you always get stabbed in the eyeballs. Let me ask you this question though. What is your area that you struggle? Like what is your guilty pleasure with finances? I don't have a lot. I really don't. I don't buy clothes that much. I'm not an impulse buyer. Where I struggle is I do not budget as well as I should for groceries. Groceries is a mm. big one. Big one. We set the budget. We, we end up every single time going over. Because we don't really... I don't want to say... I make a list. We make a list go to the grocery store. Very, very rarely is there something that I will look at that is on our list where I will say that item is too expensive for my budget. I don't want to buy that. It happens every once in a while. The price of salmon has been insane. Oh my God. Can we talk yeah. about that? Brother can't get a good piece of salmon for an affordable price. It's terrible. Um, and I love salmon too. So that's a tough one to say no to. Connor's like two steps away from just like throwing on waiters and just catching his own salmon. He's just, this is ridiculous. I'll do what I got to do. Look, we went scalloping <laughs> this time last year. I'll, I'll catch a salmon. Right. Okay. Honestly, yeah. Don't make me become a fisherman. I'll do it. If you uh, make my salmon 30 bucks at Publix, all right? I will farm to table. We will, we will get that right. All right. <laughs> we will make sure that we, we find a way to get that done. But that's, that's probably my biggest issue is that I come back from the grocery store. And I'm like, yeah, we spent like, you know, this, this much. Mm -hmm. We spent like, oh, we 150, 175, like pretty easily. And I probably should show more restraint or be more budget savvy with planning our meal for the week. Oh, Hey, there's chicken thighs are on sale this week. Let's do something with chicken thighs or something like that. Or, Oh, Hey, this, you know, this thing of bread is cheaper right now. Let's like load up on this and not, you know, not just buy it because this is what we have every single week. So there are ways around that. Like Lauren mm -hmm. used to be able to go to the grocery store and buy like a week's worth of food for 40 bucks when she was living by herself. It was insane. Man. She would, she would come. And then when she, she and I moved in, I was the problem. I was, <laughs> I was bad and not impulse things like all things that I think are within, within the norm, but I was, I was the problem. I am the problem. That's, that's my biggest one. How about you? I'm the problem. It's me. Um, yeah. So I told you, I have a story that I want to just look you in the eyes as I tell the story and just imagine how you would have processed if this happened to you. So I'm on this road trip, you know, at the spelling bee and you know what I'm saying? I feel like we crushed it. Like we had like the best spelling bee ever. My team specifically was like team captain. We were getting people their assets. We were in the truck cutting down the spelling bee. We were doing our thing. You know, we went and saw, we were so ahead. We went and saw the monuments. We were out there. I was sitting there. I was like, I'm so blessed. Like I'm, I'm, I feel like such an adult. My team is listening to me. Everybody's, you know, on time. Everybody's doing their thing. Boom, boom, boom. So I get home and I realize something. Uh, so, so I don't know if you guys are working at a big company, you'll get these emails that are like, go fill out your T&E reports, your, your spending reports. I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm that dude who's just like, I usually like, don't really like, I keep pretty good records. So I'm just like, leave me alone whenever they like, I'll kind of wait to the last like couple of days I can do it. Cause I could do it really quickly. And I'm like, leave me alone. Don't email me. I'm still hanging out. I'm doing my thing. All right. So, um, <laughs> I, the dude's like, hey, go do your T&E report. And I'm like, huh, I got a couple more days than I thought. I was like, that's weird. He's like, no, no, go do your T&E report. And I'm like, okay. So I go, I look in there. I realize, boom, while I'm on this, this spelling bee trip, I added my work card to my Uber account, right? So I add my work to my Uber account. Now, what I didn't know it was going to do is it mirrored it in my Uber Eats account. 
Oh, that's weird. That's a separate app. That's so weird that it would do that. So I thought, buddy, but it's one company and they're great at scamming people. So because, and mind you, I never said this, but because it was the newest form of payment, it became the default payment for my Uber oh. Eats account. Now, after the spelling bee, you know, one of my friends who up there, we hung out up there and then we came down. So she was staying with me. So I was ordering a bunch of Uber Eats. You know what I'm saying? After the spelling bee, I was having my little Jokic victory lap. You know, we worked for months to get here. It went really well. I'm ordering Uber Eats. All right. So I opened this T&E thing. My brother, I spent $500 on a company card on Uber Eats. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Before I, before I react to this, I need details. I need details. Are we talking $500 in over the course of a week? A month. Or- and with two people for about half of it. Okay. So I'm trying to – that's not as bad as I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say way worse. $500 over the course of a month with two people. That's the key thing to remember. Yeah. So if you're just looking at it, okay, I spent that'd be like I spent $250 on myself for Uber mm-hmm. Eats for this month. If you want mm-hmm. to break that down per day, then we're talking crap, down some quick math, some quick math. I'm talking like, okay, that's a lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot of money. <laughs> um that's bad, but I get it. I mean, the Uber Eats convenience is something that I have not gotten into until having a baby. Yeah. That changed everything though. Like when Mm -hmm. people just got us Uber Eats gift cards and Grubhub and stuff like that and DoorDash Mm -hmm. and it was beautiful. And look, the upcharge is significant, but if it's free money that somebody's already given you because they're like, oh, you know, how about new parents? You're like, just whatever, whatever it takes. The convenience of it is fantastic. $500 $500 is a lot. That's a lot, Will. I I want you to, I was sitting there. I went from horrified to like, oh my God. Like, cause they thought I was like trying to scam them for like a split second. And I was like, okay, I'll do this. How do I do this? How do I do this? They go, you're going to have to write us a check. So then my fat self had to go write a check for $500 and go to the FedEx so I could track it and send them a tracking number and say, hi, yes, I'm fat. And I spent $500 on Uber Eats on your dime. Go ahead and take this. Here's the exact five hundred dollars I spent. Take it, like, because I said, "Can you please just take it out of my paycheck, man? You're all the ones paying me." They were like, "No." I'm like, "Oh my god, this is my nightmare." I feel like this is Weight Watchers. Anyway, so that's my story. Like the the aspect that was scary was that you kind of like quote unquote catching me and me being like, "I'm sorry," but he could have been way scarier about it. But yeah, that's Uber Eats is my vice. Yeah. That okay. So that's there's a little bit of embarrassment there that's associated with that. That it's one thing if you're spending that on yourself and you you're the person that has to see that on your statement, but then your company sees it. Right. As well. Yeah. All right. That's a tough look. I, I understand. That's that, that is a tough pill to swallow. Um, okay. Let's go to the Saturday Down South podcast Facebook group. Some great responses here. Let's start with this one from Kobe Black. Kobe says, "Here's what has worked for us. We have two accounts, one for bills and one for weekly spending. When I get paid, tides come out first, then a predetermined amount goes into savings/slash bills account. The rest that is left in our joint checking is for weekly spending. My wife knows that she can spend whatever is in there until the next Friday. I get paid weekly. That way, bills are always covered without any worry of overspending." Yeah, the. The two account thing can be difficult to track. I think it's more difficult to track than one because then it's like, oh, well, you get your spending money and I have my spending money if you're if you're in a relationship or something like that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it can be really beneficial to see it and see like how you're spending and see, okay, are you blowing out of your budget, whatever it is, and is one person spending way more than another? That's Mm kind of nice as well. Um, the way that we set it up, we each have, we have like a joint account and then we each have our credit cards, which like my credit card is like pays a couple, pays a couple of regular bills. If I'm out for work stuff, that's usually what I use. And then like Lauren has a credit card that she'll use for, you know, to get miles and stuff like that or, or whatever, like buying president, buying presents for, for one another or something like that. We do that on our credit cards, whatever. Um, but yeah, there's not, and, and it all gets factored into the same spreadsheet at the end of the month. But having two accounts can be can be difficult. 
But if it's worked for you, that's all that really matters. And if you know, hey, I can spend this much money for an allotted period of time, that's really, really important. Now, the question is, what does that mean? My wife knows that she can spend whatever is in there. Mm -hmm. So does any of that money go or go towards like um, non bill related things like, okay, you want to go get a haircut, something like that. Oh, you want to, you know, you need to be able to pay for, for a gift for your mom or something like that. Does, is that part of it? Like, is that part of your, your money that's just there? Or is that part of your bills? Like being super, super specific is what something that I have found to be really helpful and also really difficult because sometimes you're like, well, crap, like how do you make a budget for this? This is mm -hmm. something that I, I had to be able to spend money on. It's just a matter of kind of laying down those parameters. Like, all right, how much am I going to spend on a, on a gift for somebody? How much am I going to spend on, on a haircut? Whatever that looks like. Um, but if you got a system like that, that works for you, then more power to you. And obviously you're making it work. Uh, let's go to this one from Wes Medeiros. Wes says, I asked my wife how much money we have. Look, Wes. <laughs> you know, good answer, man. I've definitely had my moments where I've been that. And having your moment, like, okay. Let me preface this by saying I am a cautious spender. I know what our accounts look like. It's not just totally in control of Lauren or anything like that. But if you're going to pay a credit card bill, hey, do we have enough money in this account? Whatever. Um, so you just have no idea. <laughs> you just have no idea. That's dangerous. I mean, you try. I honestly box. envy that life because I'm sure there's like a little sensor that goes off if you get up against the number in the US. Like, hey, what are you doing over there at the pub? And you're like, uh-oh. I, I like closes the app of like the sign Kirby smart uh, visor. Well, nothing. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I would just want to know out of sheer curiosity, if nothing else. And if she, she's got a lot of power, if she just knows that mm -hmm. at all times, I mean, what's to say that she's telling you the exact number. Hey, we're gonna <laughs> could get like a Darren McFadden situation going on where she's like your agent. And you're like, Oh, you put that in my retire, right? It's like, nah, we got a condo now. Get a Johnny Manziel grandparent situation where you just got him <laughs> laundering money for you. Like, hey, you know what? You just there, there's there's a slippery slope, but Wes is doing mm -hmm. whatever he can to make it work. Dave Cozart says a lot of mobile banking sites will do it for you, just kind of like what what you were talking about. Um, mm -hmm. I bank with Huntington, and they break your monthly spending down into categories. My wife and I have tried to go to the spreadsheet route several times, and we never stick with it, unfortunately. The easiest thing for me is to just check my online banking regularly and either use auto pay for bills and pay certain bills at the same time each month so it's not all coming out of the same check. I recommend putting whatever amount you can in savings each paycheck. As the saying goes, pay yourself first. That's really the whole purpose of budgeting, right, is saving. That that's that's the biggest thing because it's you can tell yourself I'm not spending too much here I have enough money in my account there but that savings account that 401k that Roth IRA what, whatever it looks like that's really what this is supposed to all be about I think to a certain extent and there are certain people that I know who don't spend frivolously but they also just don't care about savings they're like you know what mm -hmm. that part of my life. It'll be there eventually. I'm not planning on being one of these people that's trying to retire at 55 or anything. I'm just, you know, I'll, I'll figure it out if and when that time comes. And some people just don't actively worry about that. Um, I think that's such a big part of it, though. And they, they always say, like, do what you can in your 20s because it benefits you so mm -hmm. much more down the road. And obviously, once you have kids, it changes everything with that. That's Factoring that into your budget and just throwing in some of the expenses that come with that, it's not fun. It's not, especially when you're telling yourself, and I know we talked about daycare in the last pod, especially when you're telling yourself, oh, daycare is going to be this price. And then you kind of realize after doing some research, no, it's actually not. And this is going to suck. And you're going to have to find that money elsewhere. It's it difficult. It's mm -hmm. really, really difficult. Um, yeah. Budgeting when you have kids. Not ideal. How people do it with four kids, I will never know. 
I will never know. Honestly, yeah, I was having this convo. There's a guy that uh, like uh, on my team that I manage. I was having a one on one with him today, and we were talking about. He's like, you know what summer camp costs? Like, not even. Day. I was like, oh my gosh, bro. And we were kind of going back and forth, like, how do you do it? And then we kind of took a step back. You know, we're so lucky that we have jobs that we love that, like, you know, what I'm saying, like, pay us a fair, like, decent wage. Like, there are lots of people that are on that like gig economy, like driving Uber and stuff. And I was like, what about those people, bro? And then we just took a step back, and it's like, yeah, I mean. It's it's tough. If it's tough for us, who it's like we're kind of living our dreams. Like you're the lead writer at a sports site. I manage people at a social media site. I I we are really lucky, and we're still trying to figure this stuff out. That's the crazy thing. Yeah, if you if you're in a spot where you don't have to do <laughs> budgeting and you, you don't feel like you you really have to care about it, you can spend whatever you want. You don't have to worry mm-hmm. about how much this trip is going to cost or that trip's going to cost. More power to you. That's great. Um, but yeah, for the vast majority of us, I think being able to break some of this stuff down and actually set some sort of limits is something mm-hmm. that we, we do either subconsciously or not subconsciously. Well, I'm saying flip that though. It's like thinking about the people in their twenties, like everybody in their twenties needs a budget, probably almost everybody in there, unless you're, you know, what's his name? Sam Bankman freed or whatever. Like, like it, it's crazy how that's, that is literally a necessary skill because of how our society is set up to just remove you from your money. How you got to know, Oh, my Netflix leaves my account this date. My Hulu leaves my account this date. My whatever you got Paramount. I don't know, but it's like, it's crazy. Cause you got to be so on top of it in a way that, you know, even 50 years ago, our society was just like, well, you know, if I don't take a, 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 a physical dollar bill out of my pocket and hand it to another man, that's in my wallet and that's all I have to worry about. Now everything is so automated that stuff just leaves your account. Like dude, the other day I got charged 50 bucks for parking and they sent me an invoice and I was just like, what do I do? Like, I guess I just got to pay this. Cause they were like, if you don't pay this in the next, whatever days it's $85. And I was like, okay, you guys win. I'm sure I didn't read a sign or something. I guess I just got to pay this because if I dispute this, I know you're all going to be like tough scene. It's what we say it is. And we decided it's 50 bucks. And if you don't like that, it can be 80, like stuff like that. It just feels like it's a new problem, you know? If you can be a single person budgeting in your twenties, you're you're winning. You're, you're doing a great job. Like regardless mm-hmm. of of what you're making, even if you're not in, in a profession that pays a ton, or you you look around, and you're like, oh, I've got people making more than more than me. You're you're doing yourself a favor by trying to at least set some guidelines by budgeting, because like mm-hmm. I was talking about this the other day with Lauren and how difficult it can be at times to want to get to a place to to start a family. And how that that process and like why it's gotten so delayed is, well, I mean, in part because of like the housing market and that's a different topic for a different time, but like how mm-hmm. long it's now takes to be able to save, to get to those places. And if it's not something that we're actively seeking, you don't necessarily have that motivation to want to do that, to want to save for a house, to want to save, to make sure that your child like actually has some money to be able to, to get regular things and, and to live a, you know, a life that you feel like you're not being stretched too thin. Um, and there's a, there are a lot of things that are in place right now that kind of pushes you away from that. And that says like, Oh, it's, it's, it's your twenties, like live it up, like enjoy it when you could do all these things, but you should still be like actively saving and finding a way to, to do that and do that with a budget. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's go to this one. Let's, let's end with this one. Uh, Tom Branham says, best advice, marry someone who is budget conscious. Yes. Best way to start, (laughs) save every bit of money that you make. Yep. How to stay on track. If you want something so bad, pay cash for it if you can. (laughs) He says he's got a horror story. Anytime I have to borrow money. Is there anything worse than borrowing money? Just in general. Doesn't matter if it's to a a lender, uh, anybody. Like Mm -hmm. Borrowing money is... The worst. Looking at interest rates, they were of course at all time lows when we bought our house, and we're like, all right, so we're just never gonna, we're just never gonna leave this house ever because interest rate is we're never gonna be able to get that again. And you could always like mm-hmm. refinance and do that stuff, but um, yeah, paying for stuff in cash. How often do you do that? Um, almost never. I wish I, w- I wish I would. My parents do that all the time. I, it's just not for me. It's smart and I should do it more often and I don't. I, mm-hmm. I just don't. Like I so You know rarely... what's funny enough? I think we don't for the exact same reason, which is that we don't want to inconvenience that cashier. Like I feel like such a jerk when I'm the guy who like takes out my billfold, takes my little dollar bill, hands it to the person. They gotta like do math and like hand it back to me and everybody else is just like beep. There's just there's not a lot of, I, I don't really that part I don't really care about money's money, like they'll 
if I got to make somebody do a little bit of math for two seconds in life, all right, whatever. Uh, that's <laughs> not the end of the world. But I I don't have a lot of things that I need it for. I only get it when I need it. It's on an as needed mm-hmm. basis because you can do everything now without cash. Like the only time I actually like get cash is like, oh, like we're going to play poker or something like that. Mm-hmm. And even something like that, we've had so many situations where it's just like, yeah, just Venmo me after. I don't really care. Mm-hmm. There's just so few instances in which you think to yourself, I should pay for this in cash. And at the same time, Tom's at 100% right. If you pay for something in cash and you see what that looks like, like if you, if you instead took your Uber eats bill and just paid for it strictly in cash, how much fright mm-hmm. you would have, like giving that person mm-hmm. money every single time, be like, Oh, let me pull up my wad of twenties to be able to pay for this. I'm not saying you're spending that kind of money on every single meal. That's no, you're right, true. bro. That's a really good point. If there was like a pay at the door option, like there's with pizza and you're just like, here you go. Yeah. Maybe, maybe like going out to a restaurant or ordering food. If you set that precedent of always paying for it in cash, mm-hmm. that would probably make a big difference. I like it really. Was. There's something, there's something about that. Like when you get the bill and you've spent probably, you know, a little bit beyond your means or whatever, you got drinks, you got appetizers, Maybe you're really hungry. You had a dessert and then you get that bill and there's something that that is just so emotionless about signing off on it. You're just like, whatever, as opposed to Mm -hmm. actually pulling out your wallet and being like, okay, we're going to get it. We got to get a few bills out here. Oh, I got to actively think about how I want to tip with in cash. Like there is a much different feeling, much more painful feeling um, that would probably be really smart that I will not be doing anytime soon. I can honestly say (laughs) I mean, I'd like to. You know what? I'm gonna hold. I'm gonna try every time I go out to lunch or whatever. I'm gonna try to pay cash. It's, it's not, in that in that spot. It's actually a baller move. I, I'll try that. How about you invent the app Uber Cash? You can do whatever you want. You can get a ride. You can get Uber Eats. Everything goes. But instead of having a card linked to your account, it's just cash. Nothing mm-hmm. else. That was old west economy. <laughs> You pay for you pay for a ride in gold. Actually, that's that's the new currency. <laughs> I've become Rick Harrison from Pod Stars, and people are just <laughs> walking up to me and doing commerce with me in cash. I'll give you twenty bucks for it. That's the old Rick Harrison. Oh. Uh, okay, I think that's I think that's a wrap. Um, like I said, we're gonna do East Crystal Ball next week. We're getting closer. We're getting closer, everybody. That's good. We're. <sighs> We're, we're almost now there. You bummed me out about LSU. I'm not excited anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Hey, <laughs> uh, who knows? Maybe I just opened the door for LSU to win a national championship and I'll get cold take really hard. Wouldn't be the first time. Would not be the last. Leave us a five-star review. Subscribe to this podcast. Follow us on X. Still don't like saying that. At the SDS pod. Just follow at Twitter. Here, at, be the at change you want to see in this world. I know, right? Be the change. Join the Facebook group. Hear your name right on air with figuring out our bold and brash. Thanks, guys. Talk soon.